Thank you for joining us today. My name is Janik Goriev, and I'm the Health Information Specialist with Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. We are very excited to offer our third webinar of the 2013 Healthcare Professionals Webinar Series with Dr. Linda Balmese. Before I introduce Dr. Linda Balmese, I would like to get an idea of who is online with us today. So if you can take a moment, I'm going to post a poll question. And we would like to get an idea as to who is online with us today. So if you could choose one, uh, are you a healthcare professional, a volunteer, a family member or friend, a patient or survivor, or other? I'll give you a moment to answer that question. Right, so it looks like the majority of the people online with us today are healthcare professionals. Here we go. So we have 68% of you are healthcare professionals. That's great. And um, just one more question before I introduce Dr. Balmy. Um, just try to get an idea as to who exactly is online with us. So your primary role, um, are you a physician, a nurse, a social worker, an occupational therapist, physiotherapist, or speech language pathologist, or other. And it looks like we have a good variety of people online with us today. Great. So it looks like we have here um, some physicians online with us, a uh, majority of nurses, some social workers, and a good chunk of Let's get started. Um, Dr. Linda Balmies is an associate professor in the School of Nursing at the University of British Columbia and an affiliate nurse, science, nurse scientist at the BC Cancer Agency. She also holds a Canadian Institute of Health Research, CIHR, New Investigator Award. For the past 17 years, Linda has focused her research program primarily on the healthcare decisions made by people living with or at risk for cancer. She has a special interest in how individuals and families touched by cancer can be best supported in making safe and informed treatment decisions about complementary medicine, also known as CAN. To this end, Linda has been involved in numerous nationally funded projects that have explored the treatment decision-making processes and information needs of cancer patients who are using CAN. In addition, Linda has been a co-investigator on several research studies that have examined the efficacy of select CAN modalities. Dr. Belmese has also presented at various healthcare professionals workshops and information day conferences for us here at Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada. And we are very pleased to be collaborating with her again on this webinar entitled Complementary and Alternative Medicine and Cancer, Supporting Patients and Families in Making Safe and Informed Choices. Dr. Belmese is joining us from Vancouver, and I want to welcome Dr. Belmese, and I'll turn it over to you now. Great. Thanks so much, Janik, and good morning or good afternoon, wherever you are in Canada. It's a real pleasure to be uh, here today and carrying on with my collaboration with the Brain Tumor Foundation of Canada in sharing some of our information that we've been working on out in Vancouver uh, related to how do we support uh, patients living with cancer or with brain tumors in making safe and informed decisions related to complementary medicine. Uh, it's great to see so many people joining us today, and uh, I hope we'll have some time for some dialogue throughout the presentation, uh, as well as at the end. So I'm just going to carry on and start moving forward um, with our presentation today. And hopefully everyone can see my screen uh, and our slice, uh, slideshow that we'll be going through today. So to begin, um, in terms of what we're hoping to achieve today, and I, I do want to point out that this webinar has been created uh, for health professionals, but I definitely feel that if there's patients and family members joining us, that you also will be able to benefit um, from this presentation today. We're really hoping to give people um, a sense of uh, why it's important that we address CAN and cancer as health professionals when we're working with individuals living with brain tumors, as well as their family members. We also hope to give you some resources, some credible uh, sources of information related to complementary and alternative medicine that you will be able to use uh, in the future in, in helping patients make informed decisions related to these types of treatments. 
Uh, lastly, we want to share with you uh, a decision-making approach, shared decision-making, that we've used in our research program at the uh, Complementary Medicine and Education and Outcomes Program, CAMEO, to help patients make CAM decisions in a way that not only acknowledges the evidence, but also acknowledges their beliefs and values and goals in using these types of therapies. So just to begin and to make sure that we're all on the same page, when I'm using the acronym CAM, or Complementary and Alternative Medicine, what I'm referring to is a group of diverse medical and healthcare systems, practices, or products that are not presently considered to be part of conventional medicine. This has definitely been a moving target for us uh, in this field because historically, you know, 15, 16 years ago when I began research in this area, uh, therapies like acupuncture were considered to be very alternative and outside of conventional medicine. We now see therapies like acupuncture being actually embedded with the many cancer treatment centers throughout North America, as well as in Asia and Europe, as being an integral part of supportive care. So it definitely has been a moving target, and it also shifts depending where you're located geographically. Here in North America, we definitely are seeing a movement towards integrated medicine where we see these therapies being embedded, particularly in supportive care programs. But if you move to somewhere like Asia, we see many of these practices actually being part of standard conventional uh, cancer care. So uh, it really depends historically and geographically where you're located. When I talk about CAM or complementary medicine, um, most of the time we automatically think about the natural health products or the biologically based therapies. And these are among the most popular therapies that are used by people living with cancer as well as those living with brain tumors. The other therapies that exist in this rubric of, of therapies, though, are things like body-based therapies, for example, massage or chiropractic care, mind-body therapies such as meditation, relaxation, um, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction. These are the therapies that we often see in, embedded in our supportive care programs for cancer patients. We also have therapies that are based in energy um, paradigms. These are things like acupuncture, Reiki, or Qigong, where the idea is, is that uh, illness and health is really related to how energy flows in our body, and these therapies aim to try to improve energy flow throughout our, our, our health and our, our body systems. The last one I want to acknowledge is whole systems, and that just acknowledges that allopathic medicine where most conventional cancer care is located. It's just one form of medicine. There's other forms of medicines, many that have existed for hundreds of years. So that includes such things as traditional Chinese medicine, uh, Ayurvedic medicine, as well as things like naturopathic, osteopathic, or homeopathic medicine. In terms of terminology, I'll be using the term complementary medicine most often throughout this presentation. And these are therapies that are used alongside conventional medicine. And this is what is most frequently used by individuals living with cancer or with brain tumors. Very rarely do we see individuals that are using these therapies in place of conventional medicine or alternative medicine. It's usually only about 6%. We are seeing a shift in this field, though, towards the term integrative medicine. And that's where we see a combination of conventional medicine and complementary medicine where there is good evidence related to safety and efficacy. This is also known in some circles as integrative medicine. So why is CAM important? Why are we hosting this webinar today? And, and number one, it's really related to the popularity and the consumer demand for these therapies. When we look at general cancer populations, we see up to 80% of cancer patients are using some form of complementary medicine after their diagnosis. When we look at it within a breast, can, uh, breast or sorry, a brain tumor uh, population, it's around 30 to 40%. Um, and that's looking mainly at malignant brain tumors. The other reason that these, this uh, field has become so popular has been really um, around the, the fear or the concerns around potential negative interactions, particularly with cancer treatments. We are starting to recognize that some therapies may have negative interactions with things like chemotherapy and radiation, and that's really kind of raised the alarm bells in conventional medicine that we need to start addressing these therapies. But on the flip side, we also want to acknowledge that there is beginning evidence that some of these CAM therapies may actually have benefit, particularly within the realm of supportive care. So the mind-body therapies, some body-based therapies, as well as perhaps some selected diets may actually have some benefits for people living with cancer or living with brain tumors. 
I think we also need to acknowledge that there's been a real blurring of care paradigms, particularly in the last four or five years. We're now seeing conventional practitioners actually use complementary medicine as part of their practice. And again, acupuncture is a great example where we see physicians and physiotherapists using this as part of their practice. We also see on the other side uh, practitioners such as naturopathic physicians that in some provinces in Canada now have prescribing rights. So we definitely are seeing a blurring across these different medical paradigms. And lastly, from a decision-maker, policy-maker perspective, almost $4 million is being spent by Canadians out of pocket on these therapies each year. So they definitely are a significant aspect of our health care. I just wanted to shift uh, and talk about communication of complementary medicine. And this is actually the reason why we developed the CAMEO program at the BC Cancer Agency, was that we, we recognized through the literature that up to 60% of individuals living with cancer are not speaking to their health professionals about their complementary medicine use. And there's a variety of reasons for this. Number one, individuals have shared with us um, that they've been quite embarrassed about talking about the complementary therapies they're using. They often recognize they're not based in evidence, and sometimes they can come from a paradigm that is quite disparate from the medical uh, paradigm. They've also been very worried about the reaction of their healthcare professionals. I've had patients say to me, will I get fired by my doctor if I tell them what I'm using? So there definitely is this concern around continuing with their same care provider if they're seeking care from a different paradigm. They also have suggested that some healthcare providers didn't really seem that interested in learning about complementary medicine. They had dismissive comments made to them like, well, it's not going to hurt, it's not going to help. It doesn't really matter if you use it or not. There wasn't really an engagement and conversation about these treatments. And the patients themselves often said, I don't really see me talking about complementary medicine as being relevant. I might be using a chiropractor because of a car accident I had five years ago. I don't see how that can be relevant to the care that I'm receiving related to my brain tumor. But in fact, it is important we understand about all the different therapies that these individuals are using in order for us to provide comprehensive and safe care. And when we understand that these patients are not actually talking about these therapies with their conventional healthcare providers, it raises some alarm bells about how informed our patients in making decisions about these treatments. And you know, beyond the safety issues, and there's definitely safety issues in terms of physiological harm, but we also need to acknowledge that there could be financial harm as well. Some individuals that I've spoken to have spent up to you know, $2,000 a month on using a variety of chemical therapies that can have significant impact on themselves and their families. Um, but we need to recognize that there are these benefits that could exist as well, and that some chem therapies may be a very valid option for individuals that perhaps aren't being um, having their symptoms or their care needs being totally addressed within the conventional system. They may be able to get some relief from complementary medicine, um, or it may also be an important aspect related to preserving hope as well, which I think we can't uh, dismiss as being important, particularly within the brain tumor population. The other um, issue is that when we don't open the dialogue around CAM and have an open and non-judgmental conversation, we often shut the door to future conversations about these therapies, as well as conversations about other sensitive issues. Using complementary medicine can reflect people's cultural beliefs, their you know, very uh, much personal beliefs around health and healing, and if we don't have respect around these issues, they may not feel we'll have respect around other sensitive issues, for example, around perhaps sexuality or other family dynamics that may be going on. So I'm just going to pause here, and Janique actually has uh, one of the poll questions that I uh, provided today, which was regarding, um, um, Janique, maybe you can remind us what the first poll question is. I don't have it right in front of me. No problem. So how often are you asked about CAM therapies by patients or family members? Very frequently, frequently, sometimes, rarely, or not at all. We'll give everybody a moment to answer. So Linda, it looks like about 42% have said sometimes, 26% uh, frequently, and about 30% rarely, and 4% not at all. Great. Okay. 
Thank you very much for sharing that. And it's, you know, that sounds about average. You know, this isn't a question that perhaps happens every day, although it does sound like definitely a, a group of you are experiencing this quite frequently. Um, but it's always, I always, when I talk to my colleagues, they say, you know, it's a, it's a tough situation because, you know, it's not something we necessarily have training in. And we don't get these questions all the time. They're not often part of our standard care. And it, it's quite difficult for us to actually address it. And one of the issues that people have actually said to me is that, do I actually, you know, have a duty or an obligation to discuss complementary medicine, uh, you know, with brain tumor patients or with other cancer patients if I haven't had any training around it? And some people have actually question whether it's part of my scope of practice. And I just wanted to really briefly touch on that. And, you know, foremost, I want to kind of approach it from a bioethics perspective around treatment decision. You know, and when we, when we think about our, our patients making decisions around treatments, be it conventional or CAM, we very much want to support individuals in being autonomous in making these, these types of treatment decisions. Um, and we often do that in conventional medicine by making sure that they understand the risks and benefits of the therapy options that are available, including the option of not doing anything. When we look at CAM, we need to acknowledge that people really aren't autonomous in making these decisions if they are not fully informed. And that's where us as health professionals can have a real role in making sure that people understand what the potential risks and benefits may be, or at least direct them to where there's evidence-based information for them to understand what is known or not known about these different treatments. We also need to balance this idea of beneficence doing good for our patients versus the do no harm. And again, complementary medicines may have benefits, but some of them do actually pose harm, uh, not only from their effects individually, but perhaps in combination with conventional treatments. So again, they require information to understand there are potential risks, as well as understanding what the potential benefits could be. When we reflect on supporting patients in making these types of decisions, what I always struggle with in, in our Cameo program is acknowledging that sometimes patients make a decision that I would not necessarily see as being the right decision. Uh, and what we always need to remind ourselves is that patients do have a right to make what we may see as the wrong decision. And it's important that we still stay with that patient and provide care for them and support no matter what their decision has been related to their care. Flipping towards the scope of practice issue, Again, many people say, well, you know, I don't have training in this, I don't have knowledge about it. But if we take a more generic approach to scope of practice, no matter what health profession we come from, we definitely have a role relating supporting our patients and having access to evidence-based information about therapies. That includes complementary medicines. We also need to be working with our patients to ensure that they're informing all their health care providers uh, about their complementary medicine use. Uh, again, this is about providing comprehensive, safe care that we really can't do if they're using a therapy that we're not aware of. In the Cameo program, we've seen individuals, uh, for example, living with brain tumors who have started having seizure activity because the natural health products they're using are clearing their anti-seizure medication too early. Um, they had never talked to their physicians about their use of natural health products, and it wasn't until they approached our program and disclosed that they were starting to have seizures that we were able to tell them why it was important to have this conversation with their physicians so that they could understand why they were potentially were having increased seizure activity. Also related to scope of practice is that we need to be consulting and communicating with our full care team, and that may actually include CAM practitioners. Uh, they often are quite open to communicating through letters and telephone calls about their plan of care for a patient. And in order for them to provide safe care, it would be helpful for us to also share that information with the patient's permission so that there is both sides of the care paradigm being fully informed. Lastly, we want to make sure that we're monitoring and evaluating outcomes and side effects, considering the fact that people are using complementary medicines or not. Sometimes we see increased side effects that are not related to our treatment, but may relate to treatments they're receiving from CAM practitioners. And lastly, document, document, document your conversations, the information you provide, as well as any outcomes that you may be seeing. This is incredibly important for the care team, as well as for monitoring how these therapies are actually working. So now I'm just going to shift gears and talk about what does the evidence tell us about complementary medicine.
I'm not going to be spending a lot of time on this. Um, the slides will be made available so you can go back and look at them. I just want to give you a little sense of what we currently know about complementary medicine. So to start with, there's a great deal of research that's currently ongoing. So there's a lot of question marks in terms of how helpful some of these treatments may be, particularly in the context of brain tumors. If you're wanting to know more about the trials that are available, I encourage you to go to clinicaltrials.gov and actually look up complementary medicine. And they will actually list a variety of trials that are currently going on related to treating um, brain tumors as well as dealing with the side effects of, of conventional treatment. So it's definitely quite interesting to see what's going on in North America as well as in Europe. In terms of looking at how do we synthesize the, all the evidence that's out there related to complementary medicine, the Society for Integrative Oncology is an international society that is comprised of medical radi and med um, radiation oncologists as well as a variety of other uh, multidisciplinary professionals that are interested in complementary medicine and oncology care. And they have actually, um, in 2009, created a synthesis report that I'll be reviewing uh, that has looked at the, all of the research that's been conducted and provided a practice guideline. They will be updating it next year in 2014, so definitely stay tuned uh, for that to be released. I also want to acknowledge that if, if you have patients that are asking about diet and lifestyle interventions, that we do have a summary of the evidence through the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research. And that is available through the link diet and cancer report that I have listed. So just to jump into the SIL guidelines, bottom line, the SIL recommends that we do ask all patients about their use of complementary medicine and that we provide guidance to these individuals around these therapies in an open, evidence-based, patient-centered manner. But that we also uh, advise patients to avoid these therapies as alternatives because there is no therapy at this time in conventional medicine or in complementary medicine that has been shown to be as effective as, as uh, conventional medicine such as chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. Looking at some of the specific therapies um, and the evidence around this, if we turn to the body-based therapies, we do know that there is strong evidence related to the use of massage therapy in managing anxiety and pain in individuals living with cancer, and the manual lymph drainage is specifically for individuals that are living with breast cancer. The only cautions around using things like massage is that if anyone has been experiencing uh, radiation, there needs to be some care around the use of massage so that we don't have any skin integrity issues. Also, if they use a massage that has a rocking motion and individuals are experiencing nausea, vomiting, or perhaps dizziness, there needs to be some care around that as well. There are some cautions around deep or intense pressure if individuals have any bleeding tendencies related to their cancer or perhaps due to their chemotherapy, or if they have had surgery or, again, any radiation. And that's just due to potential damage um, as well as bleeding and bruising. I did want to make a quick uh, note that exercise, while it can be quite difficult for pe people living with brain tumors due to issues around mobility, it has been shown in a variety of cancer populations to be incredibly effective in improving quality of life, helping people uh, deal with fatigue, as well as improving range of motion if individuals have had surgery or experiencing um, uh, uh, impairment of their mobility. The recommendation is that individuals have three to five times a week at least 30 minutes of exercise, as well as combining it with weight exercise resistance, as well as doing balance exercise to help with mobility issues. Turning to mind-body therapies, there's an overwhelming amount of evidence related to using mind-body therapies, and this includes things like meditation, relaxation, imagery, art therapy, etc related to uh, helping with mood uh, disturbances, anxiety, stress, chronic pain, as well as improving overall quality of life and sleep quality. There is some beginning evidence for select therapies that it may also help people cope with nausea and vomiting that isn't being well controlled by antiemetics. The only caution around mind-body therapies is specific to hypnosis, and that for some individuals, if they're taken out of a trance too abruptly, or by someone that's not well experienced in doing hypnosis, it can exacerbate dizziness, nausea, or headaches. And there are some 
restrictions around using hypnosis for individuals that may have a psychosis or other personality disorders. So it's highly recommended that hypnosis is only done by a well-trained hypnotherapist, often can be found uh, within a clinical psychologist uh, um, professional group. One therapy that I wanted to pull out that has an extensive amount of literature in the cancer uh, populations is MBSR, MBSR mindfulness-based stress reduction. And this was created by John Kabat-Zinn, uh, which is a structured psych psychological and educational therapy that not only combines mindful meditation, but also half the yoga and the breath techniques attached to it. And it's provided in a very structured way over an eight-week period with um, group practice as well as homework by individuals um, when they're out in the community. The evidence around this is very strong, showing again improvement in things like mood, sleep quality, as well as reductions in stress. What's been quite fascinating though is the beginning evidence that suggests it actually has an impact on our immune system. We see things like natural killer cell percentages increasing when people have consistently engaged in this practice. So we require further clinical trials to see what is the physiological impact of using this type of mind-body therapy. Turning to energy therapies, um, this is a field that has been quite difficult to do research in because it's a paradigm using energy to heal the body that is quite um, unique and different from what we see in allopathic medicine. But in terms of the research that's been done, we do know that the majority of these therapies are quite safe. For example, Reiki, which is a hands-on, hands-off healing technique where a Reiki master uh, is supposedly transferring energy from them to an individual and smoothing out energy disturbances within the body. Therapeutic touch is um, a procedure that's often been done by nurses as well as other individuals that have gone through a one to two year training program. These therapies have been shown to be safe and some individuals experience a reduction in stress as well as an enhancement in quality of life. We're not too sure if these therapies help and actually uh, manage symptoms such as pain and fatigue uh, and research is being done to see if it does have an effect. There has been about three trials recently on Reiki that does suggest it improves fatigue, uh, but these trials need to be done in larger populations. The only restriction or concern around energy therapies has been the actual machines that have been used that are supposedly alter a magnetic field or use electricity. And these have actually been shown to actually have a carcinogenic risk and may actually increase the risk of cancer. Uh, and they are actually, um, especially in the United States, are um, uh, warned against by the FDA. The one exception, though, to evidence uh, and safety is around um, the energy therapy of acupuncture. And for those that are not familiar with it, the idea is that acupuncture regulates the flow of energy, known as, as qi, in the body through the use of needles, heat, or pressure that are applied to certain parts of the body. Physiologically, when we look at acupuncture being done, we recognize that it causes nerve cells to release neurotransmitters, as well as it causes shifts within the brain in terms of releasing uh, things like endorphins, as well as influencing the effect of certain aspects of the brain, like the pituitary gland. When we look at its effect, particularly within uh, individuals living with cancer, including brain tumors, what we see is positive effects on managing nausea and vomiting, as well as managing things like pain, particularly neuropathic pain. However, it's been very hard to do research in this field because it's difficult to create a control or placebo of acupuncture. There has been the creation of sham needles, but often people have experienced acupuncture and it's very hard to blind them to whether they're getting it or not. There is research still going on in the role of, of acupuncture in managing fatigue as well as managing symptoms like peripheral neuropathy and we're waiting to see whether uh, the results show a positive or negative effects. The only caution around acupuncture has been if individuals have very low blood counts or are on anticoagulants because there can be a risk for bleeding as well as for bruising. And so this needs to be done by a licensed acupuncturist that has good training. Also, if people are undergoing chemotherapy, the importance of sterile technique in using acupuncture is very, very important. In terms of biologically based therapies, before I jump into natural health products, I want to briefly mention the biological therapies. 
and um, or the diet therapies. And often, you know, when patients start asking about natural health products, it's it's incredibly important to say, well, before we jump into that, let's talk about what you're eating, because uh, often, you know, patients are not eating a balanced diet. And so, in terms of of talking about dietary choices, it's really about going back to the Canada Food Guide and talking about eating a, a diet that primarily is is full of vegetables, fruits, whole grains, uh, and things like beans that come with protein, as well as things like flavonoids. Um, if there's a fear of a deficit in an individual because of side effects of treatment or um, coping with things like nausea and vomiting, then definitely bringing in a nutritionist or a registered dietitian will be important. The recommendation around body weight is that individuals should be as lean as possible without becoming underweight. But it's important that when individuals are beginning potential um, cancer therapies, that we don't recommend they begin to lose weight while they're undergoing treatment. In terms of what we want to limit, it's the high sugar, high salt, uh, food that's low in fiber, high fat food, as well as the consumption of red meat. Recommendations around alcohol is that they should be limited to two a day for men, one for women, and we always say that you can't save them up for the weekend. Um, and again, as I mentioned, salty processed foods uh, are not recommended. In fact, there are some fears that it could cause uh, an increase in risk, particularly related to GI and colorectal cancers. And when people say, well, you know, what supplements I should be using, I say, well, again, let's look at how you can get those, those nutrition, those nutrients through actual foods. And so, for example, things like berries, Brazil nuts, very high in antioxidants, as well as things like selenium. Citrus and cruciferous vegetables, again, for things like vitamins, vitamin C in particular. Fish and flaxseed for omega-3s and 6s. Legumes for the flavonoids. Same thing with teas. And then tomatoes, uh, in particular, we've been looking at them as a very powerful antioxidant, particularly the use of lycopene um, as a, pa a possible prevention preventative agent relates to things like prostate cancer. Yogurt, uh, again, for um, looking at the active uh, cultures, as well as, again, vegetables that are very rich in color that come uh, full of nutrients. Now, turning, um, turning towards the natural health products, in terms of recommendations, there really are no natural health products that have a strong level of evidence that should be recommended as a cancer treatment or to be used uh, by brain tumor patients at this time. What is recommended, though, is that natural health products should be assessed for before we begin any treatment so that we know that any interactions are possible. Also, if people are determined to use these natural health products, they should be consulting a trained health care provider that has some knowledge about the potential risks and benefits of these therapies and should be monitored, if not uh, under a clinical trial, by a trained healthcare provider. There is an exception to this, and, and that is vitamin D. And in 2007, the Canadian Cancer Society recommended that during the fall and winter months, adult Canadians should be using at least 1,000 international units of vitamin D3. And that was because of the overwhelming population-based data that suggested that when individuals were low in vitamin D, we saw an increased risk in certain types of cancers. Um, there is still additional research that needs to be done and, in fact, is ongoing at this time, particularly in the U.S., around what is the specific amount of vitamin D that we require. The upper tolerable limit for vitamin D3 right now is 4,000 international units. Uh, we know that in some populations beyond 4,000 international units, we have seen a curvilinear effect where some individuals have started to have worse outcomes when they go over that amount, um, but we still need research to know if there is a specific amount that we see the optimum effect. And beyond cancer, we want to acknowledge that vitamin D is important for other chronic diseases, for example, cardiovascular health, as well as things like arthritis. When people do say, well, you know, I'm still determined to use, uh, you know, vitamins and minerals as part of my overall wellness, you know, and they're not confident in just eating a diet that's rich in fruits and vegetables, uh, I then refer them to Health Canada's uh, Dietary Recommended Intake, and I've provided the updated um, website link for that, where they actually will list what is the recommended amount across different populations, men and women, and across different ages, um, as well as what is the upper toll of the limit uh, beyond which we start seeing toxic effects. This is a great resource to have available 
and you can even print it off uh, and be, have it available to hand out to patients so that they're aware of, of what is the upper tolerable limit and how much they require in their diet. So um, just shifting gears um, and talking about some of the natural health products that you may have had questions about and were wondering what is the evidence around these therapies. Starting off, I just wanted to briefly mention ginger. And this has really been used to manage nausea and vomiting. So when your, your mom or your grandma suggested you use ginger ale when you had the stomach flu, uh, she was pretty dead on because we're starting to see phase two and three clinical trials to show that it actually does have a positive effect in managing nausea and vomiting when it's combined with traditional antiemetics. And there is actually some beginning evidence to suggest that ginger may have an anti-cancer effect um, in different types of cancers, but we need some human-based studies to see if that actually is true. The one issue with ginger, though, is it is an antiplatelet, so you need to have some caution when people use it um, regarding their blood counts and if they have any bleeding tendencies. Turning to another popular therapy, Ruta6, this is pur um, purported to ha have an anti-inflammatory effect and potentially cause cell death in in vitro. There's only been a very small study in 2003 that looked at uh, six patients living with gliomas that showed some tumor regression, but there's been no follow-up studies or larger studies to prove that it actually has that effect. And there's been some concerns of whether it's safe when it's used in combination with some of the chemotherapy agents that are commonly used in brain tumor patients. The other issue around Ruta6 is it does increase sensitivity to sunlight as well as radiation. So if individuals are undergoing radiation treatment or taking Ruta6, you, could, you could see increased uh, skin issues as, as a consequence. And it does sometimes lead to kidney and liver problems. So if they are determined to use these, this type of therapy, potentially keeping track of their kidney and liver function may be important. Another one that's quite popular, um, particularly within the Chinese community, is Chinese skull cap, which is a member of the mint family. And when we've looked at this in vitro, it does cause uh, inhibition of cellular growth in glioblastoma cells. There has only been preclinical work done on this, again showing the inhibition uh, in glioblastoma when it's been used in combination with chemotherapy agents. Um, so really, this is not a therapy that we have strong evidence to recommend in, in individuals living with brain tumors. As well, it has some impacts in terms of causing sedation. Some individuals um, have pneumonitis as well as fever. And we also see a decrease in white blood cell counts. So if we are doing uh, you know, blood levels and we're seeing a decrease, it may not be due to our treatments, but due to perhaps this type of therapy. Another one is Don Kwai. Uh, and when we've looked at the, the studies, we have seen an anti-cancer effect in in vitro and in vivo work. Um, however, again, this is not a therapy that has been tested in humans, so it's, it's difficult for understand to, to um, um, take that in vitro and in vivo work and apply it to human populations. What's one concern about uh, Dong Kwai is that it has, an anti it has a carcinogenic effect, uh, certain constituents of it, and so long-term use may be a concern and it also has uh, the sensitivity to sun, so caution is needed when it's used in patients receiving radiation. Ginseng, which is commonly used by individuals to improve their energy levels and to cope with fatigue, has also been shown to have an anti-cancer effect through an anti-angiogenesis um, impact, as well as having an anti-invasive effect in glioblastoma. It does have some side effects, including things like GI issues, it shifts sometimes blood pressure in individuals and can cause headaches. Um, and so this can actually kind of exacerbate some of the symptoms that brain tumor patients may already have. Um, and when it's used long term, we do sometimes see hormone effects, which can raise concerns about other types of cancer, such as breast you know, ovarian cancer. It also is a, a therapy that changes blood sugar. So care is needed in diabetic patients, and it also can have interactions uh, with other chemotherapy agents that are being used. And, and the last one I want to quickly mention is just cannabis. And this is one that has undergone a, quite a lot of research most, uh, in the last few years, and we're starting to see that it may have an impact on downregulating glioma cell invasion, particularly um, uh, we've looked at it in mice models, and we're beginning to have human studies done. There was uh, most recently a pilot study done with nine patients that showed an inhibition of their tumors when um, THC was actually injected 
into um, the brain and into the actual tumors. However, as we know, there's a great deal of psychomotor and psychoactive side effects of cannabis, so it does need to be used with caution. And I'm just curious at this time, we have a poll question in terms of what other CAM therapies um, have you had questions about in your setting? Here we go, everybody. So what types of CAM therapies are most frequently asked about patient, by patients and families in your care setting? Natural health products? mind-body therapies, energy therapies, body-based therapies, or full medical systems? We'll give everybody a moment to answer that question. Okay, and we have 74% responded natural health products, and the next most popular is energy therapies, uh, Dr. Balmy's 11%. Great. Thanks so much, Janique. And you know, that, again, basically mirrors the research that has been done in a variety of cancer patients, that natural health products are among the most popular. So I'm just going to change gears. Um, you know, talking about natural health products, I think it's really important um, that we acknowledge, uh, you know, I've mentioned a lot of the side effects. These are some of the specific ones that we need to be conscious of. You know, not, many natural health products have an antioxidant effect, which can be helpful, but when we see chemotherapy and radiation therapy being used, it may actually reduce the effectiveness of those therapies. So we need to be conscious when people are using these therapies in high dosages that it may actually reduce the effectiveness. As I've mentioned, many of these therapies have blood thinning properties, and when they're used in combination, particularly with chemotherapy, we could see bruising, he uh, bruising hematomas, as well as actual bleeding from the gums and from the nose. So again, documenting and monitoring this is incredibly important. Some of them, such as skull cap, which is used by brain tumor patients, can actually cause liver injury as well as uh, interfere with how the drugs are detoxified and broken down in the body. Um, and things like uh, ginseng can actually affect um, how fast drugs are used or cleared from our body. So for example, you know, the individual using an anti-seizure medication and having that medication cleared too soon because of the natural health product they use can cause real concerns in a brain tumor population. And lastly, like any medication, natural health products can have a variety of side effects that we need to be monitoring and keeping track of um, because they may actually you know, um, negatively impact people's ability to tolerate the therapies we're providing as well as exacerbate their actual health condition. Very quickly, natural health products are regulated in Canada through the Natural Health Product Directorate uh, and on their website they do have licensed uh, natural health products and their monographs. So if you're interested in whether something is registered in Canada and what are the potential uh, side effects as well as who produces it, that information is online. And if you are seeing negative side effects of natural health products, you are able to report it through the NHP Adverse Re um, Reaction Form, and I've provided a link to that form, or you can call Health Canada directly, the same way you would about a pharmaceutical agent. We have the same system in place for natural health products. So now turning our, uh, the last bit of our, our presentation to how do we actually support patients in making um, safe and informed decisions related to these therapies. And Janique, I believe we have a final poll question at this time. We do, and I'll launch that right now for you. So what has been the most significant barrier you have experienced regarding, dis regarding discussing CAM with patients? Lack of time, lack of knowledge, lack of clear evidence, uncertainty of scope of practice, or other? Give everyone a moment to answer. And we have 45% lack of clear evidence, 35% lack of knowledge would be the top two. Okay, right. thanks so much. Welcome. Thanks so much, Janique. Yeah, it's, um, that's, yeah, lack of, of clear evidence. Uh, as you can see, uh, most of the therapies I'm talking about, I'm saying there's still studies that are being done or those studies that are being done at the in vitro and vivo level. You know, that is not clear enough evidence for us to apply to patients. And so often when we're supporting patients in these decisions, we're having to say, you know, we don't have that evidence yet. 
uh, we don't know for sure. And, and sometimes that's important information to share with patients. Some p patients are willing to live with that risk, depending on where they're at in their cancer trajectory or where they're at with their brain tumor. Uh, other individuals are not comfortable living with that level of risk or uncertainty. And that can be a very individualized conversation. So just moving on, you know, where do we actually find the evidence that I've summarized a bit today? Um, and when I'm talking about evidence, again, I'm not relying on the bottom of the research paradigm, or the research pyramid. I'm relying on the top, looking at systematic reviews, meta-analyses, as well as human-based clinical trials. And so, obviously, the first place to try to go is, is the actual source, so moving to the research articles, looking through PubMed, looking through Google Scholar. PubMed actually has a specific search engine that is specific to complementary medicine. And obviously, you know, we're looking for good quality research that has been peer reviewed. Um, and that's often where I turn when I'm trying to find information about what's the dosage that's been tested, what side effects have been monitored, and what have been the potential benefits. However, if you're looking for evidence that's been more summarized, because we often don't have time to go do a PubMed search, there are some credible evidence-based CAM and cancer websites available. The first site that I always turn to is the Memorial Sloan Kettering Herbs and Botanical Database that has cancer-specific summaries on natural health products and has monographs not only for health professionals, but also for patients. The MD Anderson Simmer Database is very similar, with the addition that they have educational videos and additional web links uh, for patients to help them in making decisions related to these therapies. Lastly, we have the Office of Complementary Cancer and Complementary Alternative Medicine, OCCAM, through the National Cancer Institute in the United States, where they have monographs on selected studies, particularly the studies that they have funded, as well as they have a searchable clinical trial database that, again, can be specific to complementary medicine, as well as different types of cancers. And if you're looking for just general natural health product websites, the Natural Medicine's Comprehensive Database and Natural Standards are very, very similar to a CPS for drugs. They're very comparable. They have the same information related to dosage, indications, contraindications, side effects, as well as links to all of the evidence that is supporting the monographs that have been developed. Um, you can access this. I'm in BC through our BC Cancer Agency Library. I know that through University of British Columbia, you can access Natural Medicine's Comprehensive Database. So often you can find these through your academic um, uh, websites, as well as through perhaps your clinical institutions. Uh, the Natural Standards one is actually available through the Cameo website, which is our research program, which I'll put up next. And lastly, if people are asking about nutritional supplements, the NIH Office of Dietary Supplements has fact sheets that are available that you can hand out to patients. And if you're looking for the website links to all of these different websites, I encourage you to go to BC Cancer Agency uh, and Cameo. Um, and uh, you can actually just type in Cameo and Cancer in Google, and our website will be the first one that comes up. And we have links to all of these websites. So now that you've got the evidence and you've been able to print off some monographs, how do we actually help people move through this decision-making process? Um, and to start with, I just want to acknowledge that we're using a shared decision-making approach where the patient and the health professional are working together, where we're not only providing them with evidence related to their treatment options, but we're also acknowledging what their preferences and beliefs are related to their care plan. And we also, in the Cameo program, use a structured uh, support framework called SCOPED, which refers to a patient's situation, their choices of therapy that they're interested in, their objectives of why they're using that therapy, the people they want to involve, the, how do you evaluate this therapy, and then what do you do after you've made your decision. And the SCOPE framework is, has been developed by Jeff Belcora and actually is available through www.scoped. Dot org, and it's a public access site, and Jeff has been more than pleased uh, to have this shared widely within the cancer community. So just diving a bit into this, when we sit down at Cameo with an individual that wants to make a decision around uh, um, natural health products or around any type of complementary medicine, we go over their situation. So what is their story? What's their diagnosis? Where are they at in their, their brain tumor trajectory? What tests have they had? What symptoms are they coping with? What treatments are they about to undergo or have they undergone? You know, what do we need to be thinking about when we give them advice or recommendations related to their use of complementary medicine? And are these people you know, uh, under time pressure in terms of beginning a new therapy or ending a therapy? 
We then look at what are the therapies that they're interested in, in terms of um, what they're hoping um, to, to, uh, to use, what have they heard about. And often this can be quite a long list. Then the most important part of the scope process is we like, what do you want to achieve? And it's not always, I want to cure my brain tumor. Um, sometimes it's about managing their symptoms. Sometimes it's about preserving their hope or trying everything possible uh, to try to, to cure their disease. So really trying to pull out what their goals are. How are they going to know when they've achieved their goals? What are their beliefs and values around uh, medicine, around health, around illness? What's their priority at this time? You know, and when we're clarifying values, you know, I've mentioned some of these already, you know, it's really reflecting on their beliefs and values about conventional treatment, complementary medicine, their lifestyle choices, as well as perhaps their cultural traditions. And again, when you're asking about what's important, it's all, not always about disease-free survival. It can be about symptoms, it can be about quality of life, it can be about emotional and spiritual well-being. It can be about preserving family relationships, so acknowledging that wider spectrum of goals. When we ask people about creating a team, who's helping them? Is there a CAM provider that's helping them? You know, who do they want to have a voice influencing their decision? Is it the whole family? Are there people that they don't want to include as part of the decision-making process? And how can we help them in pulling that team together for them so everyone's on the same page? And then when we talk about selecting a CAM provider, there are some things they need to be thinking about in terms, is this person regulated? What type of training do they have? What claims are they making? Is there any potential for conflict of interest? Are they selling therapies? Are they, you know, are they none for profit? You know, and is there any coverage for individuals when they're seeking these types of therapies? And is there a willingness to collaborate about these different therapies? There are some warning signs. If you're using a, a practitioner that's incredibly expensive or is claiming to cure your cancer, it does set off some warning signs for us. If there's no evidence of effectiveness or there's no clear treatment plan, again, these are things that could be warning signs in terms of pursuing uh, CAM therapies. And in particular, if there's a recommendation to stop all form of conventional medicine, that's a big warning sign for me that this may not be a practitioner that has, is based in evidence. When we move to evaluation, we ask people, you know, if, if you have these goals in mind, how are you going to know if this therapy is actually achieving it? Are you aware of the potential risks and side effects? Are you going to be keeping track of those if they're occurring? What do you know about a therapy? What do you not know about a therapy? And how are you going to actually monitor that? And here's just a few more key questions that we often share with patients and say, you know, you should take this with you to really consider a therapy and to keep monitoring a therapy as you're using it. Things like interactions, the benefits and risks. You know, um, can you afford it in terms of your time, your money, and your effort? It's important that you balance the good things in life, that you're not following such a strict regimen of therapies that you're not enjoying your life. And then lastly, making that decision. What's going to be the best choice for you at this time? Who do you need to talk to about that decision? Are there additional questions you need to ask? And always re recognizing that decision may change over time. And then lastly, once that decision is made, there should be an evaluation monitoring plan in place in terms of how can you consider your role in assisting patients uh, in monitoring these use um, and making sure that there's documentation around the expected and unexpected side effects, and again, considering things like adverse reporting if you see a natural health product having an unexpected side effect. So just a final word as we wrap up, you know, complementary medicine is definitely at a beginning stage. It's always changing, so it's important that you're continually going back to these evidence-based resources and the literature in order to stay current. It's important that you assume that all patients are either using or at least considering or interested in using complementary medicine and that we start this dialogue with them about the different therapies that are available and that all health professionals have a role in helping patients make safe and informed CAM decisions even if it's printing off a list of websites or a monograph about a therapy that they're asking you about. We always need to recognize that patients have a right to make any decision even if we think it's a wrong decision and that we still need to be along with them in the journey providing support and care in case they want to come back and rediscuss their decision with us and that we need to be respectful in all our communications about the therapies they're using whether they be conventional or complementary. So I'm, I'm just going to skip over this. This is the Cameo program. Please come to our website. More than happy to 
to chat with you about any problems or experiences that you may be having. Uh, we have resources online, and we will be shifting to a national program actually in the future, um, hoping to have an independent website that will not only have education programs available and clinical practice guidelines, but education and monographs for health professionals as well as for patients. So thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And I'm just going to open the, the door now to any questions or comments that you may have in our final minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Bellamy. That was a wonderful presentation. Uh, we do have time for maybe two questions. Uh, so I'll just uh, read the first one for you. I have recently heard about the use of a ketogenic diet for brain tumor patients. Just wondering your thoughts on this and whether you have seen it being used. I have not actually seen that type of diet being used. Uh, the, the diets that I've seen most common right now in, in general cancer populations has been the use of um, alkaline diets um, and acidic diets. And you know what we're seeing uh, around the literature around trying to shift the diet uh, significantly to cause a change within the body, what we recognize is that it's very difficult for us to take um, a therapy, uh, a diet, and radically change um, our pH in our body or other environments within our body just through diet alone. Uh, and there is no strong human studies or clinical trials at this time that show that a significant shift in diet beyond having a high fiber, low fat diet has any shift in cancer outcomes at this time. But uh, thank you for that question because that's definitely a, a diet that uh, I'll go back to Cameo and we'll look up to see what currently is known about it. That's great. Thank you. And just one more question. Is there any evidence of anti-cancer effects of organic food? Uh, there is not at this time. Uh, there was recently a study that came out that showed that there is no significant difference in nutrients between organic and inorganic um, foods. Uh, you know, in terms of us doing environmental research on the effects of pesticides and insecticides and herbicides, we don't have that level of research yet. Uh, you know, the Canadian Cancer Society has a, a mandate now around doing increased research on environmental effects of cancer, particularly around prevention of cancer. So we're hoping in the next 10 years we'll start seeing that data come out. But at this time, we don't know if organic foods make a significant difference in cancer outcomes. I actually do not strongly encourage an organic diet simply because that can't always be afforded by individuals and I hate to see individuals restricting themselves from using fruits and vegetables because they can't afford organic. Instead I suggest that patients you know, go towards foods that um, can be washed or peeled um, and choose that route versus only going towards an organic route. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Alneys. Um, a lot of really great information in your presentation, as always. And we do have a few other questions, but I think that it'll be best that we follow up by email, if that's okay with you. And we also have had some uh, people ask for your slides. So if that's okay with you, we will we'll share your slides with the, our participants as well. More than happy. <laughs> great. Thank you. And thank you to everybody who signed on today and take time, took the time to, to listen in to Dr. Alneys presentation. Uh, because it has been recorded, it will be up on our website within the next 48 hours or so. So we will sign off. And once again, thank you so much uh, to everybody who participated today. Thank you so much.